Got your Bible, open it to the book of Hebrews. The preacher just said he keeps really good records. Amen. Tell you what kind of God we got. Look at Hebrews chapter number eight. Hebrews chapter number eight. He said in verse number 12, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Glory to God. You know that's the Lord because everybody wants to remember everything. It doesn't matter how long you've lived right. Somebody remembers the five minutes you lived wrong. But what about a God that said you did all that you did to me, but I'm not going to remember it anymore. I'm not going to hold it against you. I'm just not going to write that down in my record book. Amen. Now flip back a page. Hebrews chapter number six. The Bible said in verse number 10, for God is not unrighteous. Mm. Let me just say something about that verse. Go back to that heap there, that one right there. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I forget. No, that would indicate that was an accident. Put that back up there, boys. Y'all's doing good. I, I, I didn't give them my phone and they're mad at me. And they're not helping me. It said, hit that Hebrews 8, 12 back up there, fellas. I'll give you my phone. Somebody run my phone back there to them. Amen. It said, there it is. Amen. Their iniquities... Will I remember no more? Will I? If he said he forgot it, that would indicate that he messed up and he did that by accident. But Brother Johnny said their iniquities, will I remember no more? Can I tell you the reason God does not remember what I was before I got born again, the reason he does not remember the way I lived before I got saved is because it was a conscious choice of the will of God. He did not do that by accident. He did not forget it by, uh, by just some luck of the draw, uh, but somewhere down the road uh, in the Trinity of God, he made a conscious decision that he would not in the will of God remember how I messed up. And I told you before, I did most of my sinning after I got saved. But he said, will I? I won't. Mm. What love that the God of heaven would make a conscious choice not to remember where I messed up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> glory they but a, just, parents can do that kind of stuff it doesn't matter how bad their kids get it doesn't matter how far they go uh, there's just some way that they always remember them in the very best way we can remember them aren't you glad thank God as a child of God brother Tommy he's not going to remember what you did against him your sins and your iniquities and your transgressions thank God almighty they're not in the record book Mm. That ought to make a Presbyterian shout. An Episcopalian sober up. Amen. Amen. Will I? Mm. How could a thrice holy God make a choice not to remember what I've done wrong? Oh my. What love. What love. What forgiveness, what long suffering. Thank God. My, I don't know about you, but I messed up enough that I remember it. What about their stuff that you can remember he can't remember? Amen. 
I just wonder, would there be anybody that would just admit tonight before you got saved, you might have had an arrest record? Anybody? Amen and amen. Boys, let me help you right there. The sheriff's department has got more on you than God does. They may get that little cabinet out and pull the drawers out and they may look your name up and there may be a record back there. There may be a, a jacket on you that says what you used to do and what you were guilty of. But can I tell you tonight, in the portals of God's heaven, when he pulls your name out, uh, it says perfect. Uh, it says long-suffering. Uh, it says faithful. Uh, thank God for the imputed righteousness uh, of the Son of God. My, uh, under my name is his record. Uh, I'm his child. Thank God, thank God. He is my father and he is my king. Glory to God. Hebrews 6.10. That's one thing that you just ain't gonna remember everything we did wrong. Mm. Here, that was Mercy. But let's look at a little grace in Hebrews 6. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Let me help you right there. He said, I tell you what, I'm not going to remember th anything you did wrong, but I'm going to remember everything you did in my name. <laughs> He said, I'm going to mark out. Hey, you might as well mark her down. The judgment seat of Christ is not a sin judgment. Our sin will not be brought up again. That's a servanthood judgment. Amen. That sin will not be brought up anymore. We stand in that judgment seat of God. It'll be how we served him. It'll be a stewardship judgment. But what about the fact he said, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to be merciful and I'm not going to remember what you did wrong. He said, but I'm going to treat you with a lot of grace. He said, because everything you've done in my name, everything you've done for me, everything you've done to the saints, I will not forget it. I don't know about you. I like that kind of record book. I like that kind of, my wife is an accountant. I'm not gonna say her name because my phone will dial her like it did this morning. I figured out what happened. I said something about her name and my watch told my phone to FaceTime my wife. She called me right after church and said, Daddy, did you mean to FaceTime me? She said, all I could see was the ceiling. I said, Mama, I was preaching. I didn't call you. I said, you don't listen at home, so I didn't figure you'd listen here. I mean, amen. <laughs> That's the truth. I asked her one morning, I said, Mama, I was trying to get a compliment. You know, I felt like I'd done okay that day. And I said, Mama, I, I felt like the preacher, it was a good service. I felt good about the preacher. Yeah. I said, what'd you think? She said, Daddy, I ain't heard you preach since we had children. <laughs> what she said. Yeah. Got back from being over in Israel, man, I jet lagged. Man, I struggled one morning, man, I couldn't have found, I couldn't have preached my way out of a wet paper bag. I said, boy, I felt like a struggle today. She said, I did too. I said, what, you decide to listen today? I mean, she's an accountant. She's rough. There's no coddling at our house. The boys come in there, I don't feel like going to school. She said, well, you go on to school if you throw up, call me. I mean, she don't, if you don't play. I remember watching my mom when she was when she kept the books for Brother Edgar all those years ago. It was there was a quicken and all these accounting programs. She'd lay that ledger. She was a little metal. Where have I, where's the church accountant? Where are you at? Are you in here? Hey Amen. They won't, they won't. She's over here. Man. You know that's a, that, that that don't normally go together, the accountant and the piano player. <laughs> Do you remember those old ledger sheets in a little metal, a flat metal folder, and you laid it out, and then it just folded out and folded out and folded out. And you had all them accounts, and I'd sit there and watch her. She was meticulous. I believe in that force balance. 
You say, what is that? When you're three cents off, you write an adjustment, three cents, and put it in there whichever way you need to go. Mama wasn't like that. She kept meticulous records. But the God of heaven is the best bookkeeper you've ever seen. But when it comes to your sin and your iniquity, he said, I, I'm just not going to remember them. But when it comes to what you've done in my name, he said, I'm going to remember everything that you did. What a God. What a God. I believe he's going to say, well, you anchored that rope down. Yeah. I thought about preaching. I may, Jacob, Jacob and the Lord, Genesis 32, there's a tug of war right there, brother. You better believe it. Two main places in Jacob's life. Y'all about ready to sing? Come on up here and pick that guitar. I feel good about that. Elijah said, Elijah said, man, bring me a minstrel. He said, when the minstrel began to play, the spirit of the Lord came on me. Amen. I like that. That's King James Bible. Amen. I don't know all of it. I'm like Brother Tony. I don't know all that Bible, but the parts I do know, I'm pretty familiar with. Amen. Amen. Two places in Jacob's life that changed him. Two places. Genesis 28. He left Bethel. He saw that ladder. The Lord at the top of that ladder. The next place is Genesis 32, when he left Peniel. At Bethel, he learned that great, he learned that great lesson of salvation. He was left, he was running from Esau, stole his blessings, stole his birthright, and he left. And he saw them angels, heard the voice of God, then the Lord began to make him all them promises. He left there a believing man. But then he came back to Penal, and the Lord was about to teach him a lesson that you don't, that he doesn't condone, condemn sin in the life of a sinner and condone it in the life of a saint. Just because Jacob had forgot while he was down there in Paydan Pay Aram with Laban about what he had done to Esau, God had not forgotten. And here he was coming back and Esau was on the loom. And the Bible said he passed over the fourth jabot and he was left alone. Jacob had always come up on the winning side. He had never found a situation or a circumstance that he was not the winner. He was about to bump into somebody. And they were going to have a one night tug of war that was going to change him forever. He left, he left Bethel a believing man. But he was about to leave Penal a behaving man. Uh -huh. Amen. Amen. Yep. Hey, he left Bethel leaping with the promise of God yeah. that I'm going to make a great nation of you. Yeah. But when he left Penal, he wasn't leaping, he was limping. He left Bethel a son of God. Yeah. But he left Penal a saint of God. Yeah. He left he left Penal, a believing man, but he left Bethel, or left, he left Bethel, a believing man, but he left a Penal, a broken man. Yeah. Broken man. What's the difference of those two places? In Bethel, he saw the ladder. Never saw the Lord, he heard him. He saw the ladder. That's that picture of salvation. But I'm afraid that's where a lot of people are stopping. That's as far as they're going. Bethel. And he said, Jacob, if you're going to be what I want you to be, you can't stop at Bethel. You're going to have to go to Penal. He saw the ladder. And can I say to y'all, you young people, you teenagers, brother Dan, you brought them young ones. Kids, listen to me. Don't settle for the ladder. Because when he left Penal, he didn't walk away saying, I saw the ladder, I saw the ladder. He said, I've seen the face of God. He said, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. Can I say to you, the Lord's not in a hurry in your life. This evening in Genesis 32, 
That was the culmination of 20 years of God's dealing in Jacob's life. He's, he's not just wanting you. See that record book? All them things that the Lord's wanting to remember about Jacob, he's going to have to remember them after Peniel because they wasn't much to remember about Jacob before then except he was a trickster, a supplanter, a cheat. Matter of fact, right in the middle of that wrestling match, Genesis 32, 27, the Lord said, what is your name? Do you think the Lord had a little just case of Alzheimer's right there? Do you think all of a sudden after six, eight hours of wrestling, the Lord forgot who he had a hold of? Well, John, the last time that Jacob, the last biblical account of Jacob answering that question was when his father asked him in Genesis 27, who art thou? And he said, I am Esau, thy firstborn. The last time he was asked that question, he lied. And the Lord said, if I'm going to change your name, if I'm going to make you a new person, and I'm going to make you, give you some new power, you're going to have to admit to me who you are. And when he said, I'm Jacob, he just threw his hands up and said, it's me. I'm everything you know I am. And I know I am. He said, just as soon as Jacob got honest with God, the Lord said, that should not be, no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. You'll be a prince with God and a prince with men. He not only made him a new person, he gave him a new power because he didn't settle for the latter. And God started chalking some things up in that record book in Jacob's life. He never was the same. Never was the same the same. You know what he did to him? I don't know how many blows they passed. I don't believe the Lord passed many blows at all. Sort of like a big man fighting a little guy. You just sort of keep him off of you. But somewhere in that tug of war it ceased to be a conflict and became a clinging. One of these days you're going to quit fighting back and just hold on. He quit at Jacob, that old man, during that struggle. He was alive. The supplanter was alive and well. The trickster was alive and well. The liar was alive and well. But all of a sudden, God touched him. And his hit was out of joint. You know what he had done? He had ran from Esau, and he had ran from Laban. And God was about to fix him that he wasn't going to run from anybody else for the rest of his life. And every time he put his foot down, he remembered what the Lord did for him, what the Lord did in him, what the Lord was going to do with him, what the Lord was going to do through him. He quit pulling. Thank God you don't have to be moved by everybody around you. But when he comes to tug around on you, my verse has been for camp for years. This is what the Lord's given me in camp. Job 40 said, I've heard of thee with the hearing of my ear. But now, mine eye seeth thee. Your dad can preach a word of God, faithful man of God, loves that Bible. Has such a reputation in this area, been a great pastor, a hardworking man of God. And he can tell you and tell you and tell you and you can hear. But somewhere along the way, you're going to have to go across that Ford Jabot and get by yourself. You may tug for a while, but then you're just going to hold on. And you can walk away from that place different. See, that little woman got to him last night. But in Genesis 32, the Lord came to Jacob. Can I ask you a question? Have you settled for the ladder? Have you settled for the ladder? Some of you can't get past the ladder to the Lord because you've not grasped that truth that he's not gonna remember all that bad stuff about you. That's the devil bringing that stuff up. Every time you get one of serious with God, all of a sudden here comes your past back at you. That's not conviction, that's accusation. That's the accuser of the brethren that's coming at you. Amen. 
Won't you put that down? Won't you put that, put that aside and say, I'm going further than the ladder. I want to get over there with a little. Can you imagine every time somebody walked out? He had always been a winner. Can you imagine when he, when he walked back over there to them, when he had them divided up, finally got back over to his family, they said, Daddy, where you been? He said, boy, I've been with the Lord and I'll never be the same. If you missed what Brother Fletcher said last night before he ever started preaching, you may have missed the most important statement that's been made in the preaching. We ask God to move, but then we won't. If we want the touch of God, we need that limp in our life. If we want to get past that he's not going to remember all that against us. And he's going to, if, we're going to, if we're going to get out of that mercy and get in that grace where he's going to remember what he does, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to move. According to the word of God, no man cometh unto him except the Father which sent me, draw him. And I'll raise him up the last day. That's a Holy Ghost moving on a sinner first. But according to James, he said, if we'll draw nigh unto him, he'll draw nigh unto me. Is that not what he said? Am I in the word of God? Amen. Could it be that he moves to the center first? And if we're going to experience that touch of God in our life, that we may need to move toward him. Are you listening? Everybody? I want some things on my ledger side. I want to make some deposits on that side. I want, to, I want to be over there. I want to have something to put at his feet. Not for my glory. I want to have something to lay at the feet of the Son of God. I want to have something in the record book. Don't you? Hey, youngins, don't settle for hearing about him. Press on until you see him. Some of us as saints of God, we've been by the ladder in Genesis 28, but that's as far as we wanted to go. Wouldn't it be something in this hour that we just bowed up and said, man, I'm not settling for the ladder. I want to see the Lord. I want to see the Lord. I want to see him. This world, this world does not need another religious production. It does not need another religious service of entertainment. God help us if we've ever needed anything. We need the we need the power of God in this hour. Man, we're living so close to the coming of God. It's almost like we could peek over into the tribulation and get a little idea what it's gonna be like. I wonder if some of us limped out of here tonight. I wonder how different Sunday would be. I wonder how different your family altar would be. I wonder if some of you leapt out of here, you might have a praying place like preacher was talking about. Amen. Hey, Sunday school teacher, how long has it been since you limped into your class? Because you've been with the Lord. I told him today at supper. Probably one of the most times I've ever been around anybody that I felt had been with the Lord. I was about 16 years old. Brother Edgar Thomas was my pastor as a boy. He had, he had left the church by now. And he was off in evangelism all the time. He preached 52 weeks out of the year when he was pastor. The mom sent me with a pan of, of turnip greens and, a, and a, a pan of cornbread and a Vidalia onion. He liked that. So she sent me one afternoon to his house. I knocked on the door. And Miss Catherine, his wife, came to the door. I said, Miss Catherine, is Brother Edgar home? And she said, son, she said, Mark, he's in the study downstairs. She said, he's been praying. And this is what she said, honest to God. It's 4.30 in the afternoon. She said, he's been down there praying since about 6 this morning. But this is what she said. She said, I ain't heard him in the last 30 minutes, so he's probably done. I said, 6 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon. And here I am, a little 16-year-old boy, not even half right with God. And I stood at the door, and I knocked on the door of that study. 
That old preacher man walked to the door in a pair of pajama pants, a pair of bedroom shoes, and a tank top t-shirt. I felt more power of God when he walked to that door. His face was swollen. His eyes were red. You say, what had happened? He'd been over there with the Lord like Jacob was with the Lord. I felt like he was looking into the deep recesses of my heart. I, wanna, I want them kids when they come to camp, I, I want to have something like that on me. Where I get around and say, man, there's something different about him. Brother Willard, you say run 100 preachers across the platform, you'll be lucky if 10 have got the touch of God. 10 out of 100. Why? There's a lot of us leaping, but ain't many of us limping. How about it tonight? They're going to sing this record book. You might ought to come thank God that he ain't going to remember what you did. And then you might ought to stay a little bit longer and thank God he's going to remember everything right you did. And then some of us ought to quit tugging against him and just latch on and say, Lord, you say, how many blows were passed that night? Don't know, but I know there was one that changed it all. It changed it all. It changed it all. Wouldn't it be something? You say, how am I going to anchor that? How am I going to anchor that rope? Probably anchored a lot better limping than you would leaping. Some of you mamas and daddies, you want to know what's at stake? Right there. Y'all want to know what's at stake? Right there. Right. Y'all want to know what's at stake? She is. She right. is. She is. Brother Daniel, you, you tote these children around. They're, they're who you're anchoring for. You moms and dads, grandparents, you silver-haired folks, and I'm in your crowd now, praise God. I don't mind it. I'm just glad I got some on my head. Can I get a witness? It's this crowd and that crowd and this crowd that you're anchoring for, for the next generation. We're going to do that a whole lot better if we've let him touch our life in such a way that we'll never be the same. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We're standing tonight. I almost, I would almost, I'd almost lay that rope across this, across this altar and say, Lord, would you touch my life so I can do everything I'm supposed to do, my part on that rope. Some of you daddies, you ought, to, you ought to say, Lord, I want you to touch me to where I can be what my children need and what my wife needs. Ma'am, you ought to ask the Lord to touch your life so you can help mold and make those children God's given you to be used for the glory of God. Church members, you ought to say, oh God, would you touch me so I can be on the rope with my pastor. God, would you touch my life? I don't want to settle for the ladder. I don't want to settle for that great lesson of salvation. Lord, do that great work of sanctification in my heart. They're singing. He's got a record book. Y'all to mind it. Sing on. Would you come? Would you come tonight as we close out the camp meeting? Wouldn't it be a blessing to walk out of here limping, forever changed, your life forever different for the glory of God? They're singing. Y'all to mind the Lord. Some of you grandparents, it wouldn't hurt you if your adult children are in here to get them down, get your grandchildren down, and ask God to touch them. Would you move? It'd be a good night to come. It'd be a good night to come. I'm sure my name will not go down. It'd be a good night. You say, preacher, if I brought my children, it would embarrass them. I'd rather my kids hear my voice and hear their mother's voice calling on God. I wouldn't worry about that embarrassing them. You'll be glad you did one day when you can't get them down anymore. But there's a record book. Would you come? My name is 
How about it, Daddy? Would you just slip your hand over your mama's, your mama's head and say, let's go, Mom. Let's go. Let's go. How about a young person? Have all your sins the ladder? Wouldn't it be a blessing to get over there with the Lord? Oh, God. Sing on. What a merciful God. I will not. He's not going to remember our iniquities. What a graceful God. Oh, my. Oh, my. How about it? Would you come tonight? Would you come from the balcony all the way to the floor? Pray where you're at. Get your family down. Won't be lost. Or That's right, son. Come on. It's kept safely in How about it? God's There's still time to come. Book. How about it? Would you take that next step? Would you take that next step with the Lord? My name is written in. It was, it was recorded there when I got born again. Second verse again. How about it? If you still got time to come, would the God some young people would decide, I'm not just going to get by. I'm not just going to get saved, and that's as far as I'm going to go. Would the God you throw your life in and say, Lord, I'm yours. Use me as you see fit. Oh, God. I've got a lot of regrets, but serving Jesus is not one of them. Dead man. I've got a lot of regrets, but getting saved ain't one of them. Amen. Thank God I'm in the record book. He said he's got a book of remembrance. Thank God my name's in that book. No one can blot it out. It's still forevermore. It's in that book of life. Let's sing that Death chorus with them. The sing Lord. that chorus. Here we go. For now there's a record book. Sing. My name is written. Y'all to thank God for it that. Was it can't be taken away. When I was born again, no one can blot it out. It's still forevermore. I think we probably ought to sing that one more time. I don't just catch you just right, but it doesn't matter. Hey, I'm talking about when the stars fall out of the sky and the mountains are carried into the sea. My name will forever be recorded. In the Lamb's book of life, I can't take it out. The devils of hell can't take it out because they didn't put it there. No one can blot it out. It's still forevermore. It's in 